This episode is brought to you by Perspective Space, a community gathering venue in Encinitas, California, that fosters mindfulness, sustainability, creative expression, and connection. More about them later. Hello and welcome to In the Art Scene podcast, an art podcast that has it all. I'm your host, Galena Marquez, and I invite fascinating people to talk about their personal creative journeys, success stories, and inspiration. We talk about art business and marketing, how to find your creative voice, and all the new trends in the art world, like NFT, AI, and such. Join me and my guest for today's conversation. This episode is showcasing one of many talented San Diego artists. I am deeply passionate about our local arts community and very excited when I have a chance to bring my fellow San Diegans on the show. This passion led me to start a new project, SanDiegoArtDirectory.com. It's a free platform that serves as the ultimate hub for all things related to the rich tapestry of arts and culture in our county. On the website, you can find events, workshops, arts organizations, information about the shows and concerts, anything that an art lover like you may want to see and experience in San Diego. And for fellow artists, there is an information about the open calls, grants, other opportunities, services, venues, and many other resources to help you advance in your art practice. And you can post on San Diego Art Directory too. Join sandiegoartdirectory.com, create a free account, and start posting your listings today. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly email updates. And now let's get to our today's guest. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to In the Art Scene podcast. And guess what? You are right. I have a special guest again <laughs> every episode. Uh, uh, this time I have uh, an amazing woman in arts here in San Diego County. Her name is Alessandra Moctezuma. She is the gallery director and curator and also a professor of museum studies and Chicano art uh, in San Diego Mesa College. And that's about what I'm going to tell you because I want her to introduce herself and we will start our conversation. Hi, Alessandra. Hi, Galina. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. So um, let's begin way, 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 way back because like to me, um, without I, I don't have a formal education in arts. I'm kind of like uh, a lot of artists, you know, taught a lot uh, by myself, had had some education uh, in fashion design, which included some formal training in, um, you know, color theory and, and drawing and, and all that other stuff. But that's like, I cannot even compare what I have learned to what you must have learned. And I am really curious uh, about your thought process and how, when and how did you decide to go that route? I know you are an artist, but you are also, uh, you're an academia person. Like to you, the art is, is a science almost. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes. Well, I, um, I kind of grew up in the arts because I'm from Mexico City and my, um, parents were very involved in, arts and culture in, in Mexico City. So my father was a filmmaker and he was a uh, an anchor for the news in the evening. He also had a, um, a radio program that which he basically introduced jazz to Mexico. And, um, and he had started out as a painter and then got into theater, got into performance and then got into television and film. And, and my mother, um, was somebody who loved the arts and, um, she was one of the, I think, best dressed women, you know, in it that I know. And she loved fashion. She loved theater. And she worked for the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. So, um, so my parents had many friends who were artists and I grew up kind of surrounded by artists and going to art exhibits. My house was filled with original works by many of their artist friends. And, and then since I was little, I loved to draw. So, you know, so it was a passion since I was a little kid. Like, I think when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an 
an artist, a ballerina, and an astronaut. So those were the three things. That's amazing. Yes, yes. And I loved astronomy, so that was my other passion. But um, as I grew up, you know, we... um, I continued to to love the arts. We lived in Madrid for five years when I was a teenager, and my parents uh, were able to take the time to take us to like Paris and London. So I basically grew up going to the Prado and the Louvre and National Gallery and just seeing all these amazing paintings. And and that's what kind of more solidified this idea of like wanting to be an artist. And um, and really, I learned. Uh, you know, from school, but I think learning from seeing the works in person, you know, being in front of a painting and being able to see the brush strokes and get up close and see the texture, uh, that was like amazing, you know, to grow up uh, at that time. And I think at that time in school, you know, we would go to the Prado and we would copy, you know, the Velasquez painting. So I did many replicas of kind of Velasquez and I learned a lot by doing that, by drawing like that. Then we moved to Los Angeles and uh, initially I actually was going on a fashion path uh, because my mother was concerned that in the arts I wasn't going to be able to make a living. And I loved costume design. So initially I, I went to the Fashion Institute um, uh, for about a year. Um, but then I, um, took a painting class at Santa Monica college, just kind of like the summer program. And, um, and I did a painting and I remember the professor said, how long have you been painting? And I was like, I've never painted, you know, with oils. It was like my first time. And he's like, yeah, oh, you're, you know, you're so talented and all that. And so I kind of decided, uh, to just follow that path and just switch my, you know, switch my major from fashion to painting and studio art. And, um, and I went through Santa Monica college, which had amazing professors who actually had studied, you know, at many of them at UCLA and, um, with great painters like Diebenkorn and many of the California artists. Um, and Santa Monica college was a community college, uh, but they had a mentorship program where they were testing it out as a pilot and they were giving studios to uh, a, a small number of of students that were considered to be kind of really good. So, so me and, uh, and four of their students were given studio spaces at Santa Monica College to kind of focus on our work, uh, kind of an independent study with some of our professors. And and that's where it got me hooked, right, into the arts. And I transferred to UCLA and I went through their studio arts program. That was really great also because I honed my skills in drawing and painting at Santa Monica College. Uh, and it was it was a combination of kind of traditional, um, with, but also looking at contemporary works. But at uh, UCLA, they really... Um, wanted to teach you about video and performance art and book arts and printmaking. So I was able to expand uh, my knowledge of the arts there. And of course, they both have very robust art history programs. So I also had very good teachers. And interestingly, art history was easy for me because I had already kind of experienced art history when I lived in you know, in Europe and also growing up in Mexico, also in terms of archaeology, anthropology. Um, My mother used to like take me to the Museum of Anthropology and I used to run around and learn about all of the different artifacts and made friends with all the guards and the docents. So it was a really (laughs) fun experience. Uh, And so I went through the UCLA program and then I I ended up, uh, when I finished with my bachelor's, I was lucky enough to land a job assisting a muralist. So uh, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine from Santa Monica College, Celia Co., she was at Cal State Long Beach, and she got into this public arts program to paint a mural at um, in in Long Beach, and she they needed more people, so she invited me, and that was just right when I had finished my bachelor's in painting and studio art. So. Um, so this artist, Eva Cockcroft, she was an artist originally from New York, had moved here. She hired me to paint this mural. And of course, I knew the history of muralism because in me- part of Mexican art history is the Tres Grandes, you know, the great muralist Rivera, mm-hmm. Siqueiros Orozco. So I had 
so this idea of painting a mural was very exciting to me. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, from easel painting now to painting this large wall. And it was, yeah, it was like 120 feet long by wow. 50 feet tall or something like, no, no, 30 feet tall. It was not that tall. It was one story, but, uh, but it was a big, big mural. And, um, and we got to train, we got to work with, uh, high school students and we got to train them also in painting. And, um, and so I was really happy with that job. We, it was the whole summer, but when it finished, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, where I could go next. And Eva recommended me to work with Judith Baca. And Judith Baca is the kind of leading Chicana muralist. Um, she painted a half mile long mural in Los Angeles called the Great Wall of Los Angeles. She's now completing that. She's right now at LACMA painting the mural kind of live for people to see. Um, and she hired me to be her painting assistant. And so the best job ever, you know, I just would arrive at her studio. She would make me coffee. She would have pastries. And she would tell me, this is what we're going to paint today. By that time, she was painting large uh, portable murals. So they were like, you know, six feet by 10. And no, six feet. Yeah, something like that. Six by 10. And they were on canvas and they were hung in her studio. Uh, and she had like a raised kind of scaffold. And we would go up and paint these murals. That was called the World Wall of Los Angeles. The World Wall. And it was murals that were done by her and artists from all over the world. So she had traveled to Finland. She had traveled to the Soviet Union. There was a Soviet Union at that time. And she had traveled to, um, she was then in the process of going to an mural in Mexico, one in Canada. And so um, so I started helping her with this World War project. And, um, and it was it was just amazing. You know, you you get paid to paint for like eight hours and and get the wonderful stories from her. And um and when I worked with her for about a year on those murals, we finished the murals. So then she hired me to work at her arts organization, which is the Social and Public Art Resource Center. SPARC is located in Venice. Uh, it still exists today. And it's an organization that was painting, um, commissioning artists to paint murals all over the city of Los Angeles and also had a gallery space and had studios for artists. and. Um, and then I um, I worked with her and I applied for graduate school and I got in at UCLA. And so so then I while I was going my, doing my graduate studies, I was also working uh, with Judy at Spark. And that exposed me to a whole other aspect of the arts, which is arts administration. I um, we had a gallery space, so I also worked with a curator. And that exposed me to uh, curating exhibitions and organizing exhibitions and also a lot of um, grant writing, um, doing presentations for the public and elected officials, understanding kind of the political process that is tied into support of the arts. Um, It was like I went to college and I learned about, you know, techniques and painting and art history, very academic. But then I went to, I call it University Judith Baca, Mm -hmm. and I learned everything about how to run a nonprofit arts organization and curate and be in the arts. And so the most um, practical skills I actually learned by working with Judy in her organization. And, um, And by the time I finished my master's in fine art, I had already four years experience working in the arts. So then I got a job for the um, Metro Art, which is the um, arts program, public arts program for the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, which is basically was building the subway and the light rail in Los Angeles. And they had a... a, um, obligation of a half percent of the construction cost of every station had to go to arts. So if you think of underground stations, that was, you know, half a million dollars that was going to go into the arts. So I already had a lot of experience with, with, you know, project management, curation, working with the public, working with, with communities. Um, 
So I had that job. And so that's kind of my transition into the arts. And by the time I got the job at the MTA, I told, I remember I told my mother, see mom, I'm, I chose the arts and I did, I'm not going to starve. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm going to have a full-time job that's going to be working in the arts. And, you know, I was doing also my art. So I would go to my job and then at night or on the weekends, I would do my art. And so I made that at that time, that commitment to continue doing my work. And, um, but it was really wonderful because I, you know, art became my passion. Meeting, working with the artists is wonderful. You know, you have that community of creatives and um, and seeing things accomplished, you know, seeing an idea accomplished into these public art pieces uh, works was was really fun and exciting at that time. So, so that was kind of my trajectory into the arts. Well, I have so many questions. Like, well, first of all, this is this is a great introduction, very very detailed story, and it, it really sounds like you know, like something that you would read in the in the uh, thick biography book by you know of some some artist in like history, which I'm sure you will have one day. <laughs> your your big uh, biography book because it, like this is. I, I kind of feel like this could be a dream of everyone who is going uh, to study arts and like, okay, how can I land this dream job? How how do I see my trajectory in this career? Because it is really like a lot of artists are just left to to do their day jobs so they can continue painting on, you know, at nights and the weekends. Um you have had an amazing career from from the get go, from college, pretty much, right? So mm -hmm. this is great. So I have a, I have a question. LA is such a vibrant um, art scene with lots of opportunities. Uh, how did you end up in San Diego County? So, um, so I was in LA, and um, I loved being in LA. You know, I was I knew a lot of people. Uh, my jobs had introduced me to lots of wonderful, you know, artists. Um, I got married in 1997. My husband, um, Mike Davis, was a historian um, and um, activist, and we, um, you know, he and uh, he was well known he wrote a famous book called city of quartz um and he was teaching at a lot of different universities and colleges um i had my job at the metro um but he um he really wanted to devote himself to his writing more fully in the, in and in, in being in academia and the reality was that even with his prestigious you know, background in, in like writing about uh, the city and his knowledge. And he got a MacArthur Genius Award in uh, around that, that time, shortly after we got married. He still was not able to get a full-time position teaching in academia in LA. Um, and so there, um, so at some point they offered him a job in New York. That was a really great position in New York. And so, um, so I decided to, you know, we decided to take that opportunity and we moved to New York to Long Island to Stony Brook. And I decided I would go and do my PhD. And so we moved there and we were there. I started my PhD in, um, in art history and, um, it was, it was great because I was exposed to, you know, a lot of artists in New York. We were close to the city. It was super exciting. Uh, I, I made a lot of new contacts. Um, but after two years, I was just missing California so much. And, um, and just by chance, there was a job at San Diego Mesa College. And my sister lives here in San Diego. So just, you know, out of curiosity, more than anything, I, and just to, you know, to see, I, I applied for the job here at the college, not even thinking they were going to call me, you know, because that it's very competitive, right? It's very, very competitive. And in LA, I also had looked for jobs in academia, the same as my, as my husband, who was, you know, a lot more well known. And I also had had no uh, luck. You know, I was kind of, after five years in public art administration, 
I was done with learning everything I was going to learn. And I really wanted to go into the teaching of art. Um, so I applied for this job, the job at Mesa College, and they called me for the interview. And I said, oh, cool. You know, I'll go for the interview and see my sister. So I came down for the interview and and they uh, and because I thought I was not going to get the job or I was like, well, you know, I'm finishing my Ph.D., I was not nervous at all. I had like the best time in the interview. I just like I was great. I I did the <laughs> demo. That's what happens, you know, where you are not nervous. You are yeah, like, just, yeah, you know, you're relaxed. Dude. You're very relaxed, and you know, I was joking with them, and I did a great lesson about cicadas and muralism, and uh, you know, I told them about my background curating, working with Judy at Spark. And and many a couple of people in the community were actually uh, Chicano artists, so 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 I think they really connected and they were very impressed. And and so I went back to New York again, not thinking anything was going to happen. They called me back to for the they said you're a finalist now. Wow. So I came back. So I said, well, again, I get to see my sister. Now there was like higher stakes, right? Because now I was a finalist, so I didn't know how many other people they were interviewing. So I came back and I was prepared and. And by that time, I, I, you know, I told Mike, I told my husband, you know, I, I mean, it would be cool to be in San Diego. We would be still, I would be close to my sister. Uh, I was really interested in, uh, in, in, in my PhD. I was thinking of doing some work on border art. Mm -hmm. And so I already knew about a lot of artists who were here in the area, like in San Diego, but also Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And and so I thought, well, you know, if I end up in San Diego, that could be a really good thing. And and then you're also pretty close to LA, so you can kind of continue to be within that sphere of influence of Los Angeles. And just New York, I it's it's a different world. You know, New York is exciting and it's wonderful, but it's it's the Latino community there is is diverse, but it's not Mexican in 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 you know, and and I kind of think I've I I miss that, you know, I miss that connection. And so I came and in it, interviewed for the, um, for the, you know, as a finalist. And I remember the, the president of the college at the end said, you know, like, do you want to say anything? And I said, this would be my dream job because I could curate the space, the gallery, and I could bring attention to a lot of artists that are very important. And I, and I love working with artists and bringing that to the college and the students and I also said, I would love to teach the students what I learned with Judy Baca. I would love to prepare those students for working in the arts and getting them the, those real jobs in the arts. And I feel I have the full background and expertise to do that. And so I went back and they called me and they said, you got the job. Wow. And... I was like, oh my God, okay. So then I had to tell Mike, now you have to find a job down <laughs> in California. <laughs> After we've been there for two years, only two years, right? And so luckily he was fully supportive of my career. You know, he told me, you know, sweetie, you know, this is just so important for you and to be close to your family and would be great. And so he's like, Usually the wife follows the husband on this case, you know, he followed me here and he was able to get a job, luckily, you know, at UC Irvine, a full-time position mm -hmm. of UC Irvine in history. So, so after, so, so I arrived at Mesa College in uh, aug late August, 2001. Uh, and Mike was still in New York when the um, World Trade Center, you know, 9-11 uh, mm -hmm, happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, you know, it was, it was stressful. But that's my memory of like starting at Mesa College and then 9-11 happening. And so I've been at Mesa for 22 years. And I, you know, and I still today love my job. You know, sometimes after five years of public art, I was tired of public art. I've been teaching for 22 years and I still wake up every morning feeling so lucky that I get to go to a beautiful, you know, campus community that is so supportive of the arts. And I've, um, I've built my program to really, you know, uh, get the students these successful jobs in the arts. So I've been able, looking back you know, at what my dream was when I started that job in that interview and what I said, and looking at what I've accomplished, 
I feel so happy and satisfied that I've been able to to do this. And um and yeah, and and so so yeah, so that's that's how I ended up in San Diego. But I actually love San Diego because I've curated a, a few exhibitions on art about the border. I've I've did one at the Oceanside Museum of Art that was part of the Getty Pacific Standard Time LA LA initiative. And um I've been able to uh, show a lot of artists in our gallery that connect to themes and topics that I'm interested in. And it's not only border arts, but also, you know, feminist art and, you know, um, environmental issues. Um, and, and the wonderful thing out of the college is that you build those, these relationships also with the other departments. So they also come and they see how art is important in communicating these ideas. Uh, and, and, you know, it touches your, your emotions. It touches your soul. It's, um, aesthetically interesting. It's intellectually compelling, but you are touching upon all these different topics and subject matter, uh, that connect with people in the sciences or people in Chicano studies or, um, women's studies or history. And so, uh, so I love, you know, what I do in terms of the curation, um, and I feel that there are, we need more spaces in San Diego that can feature the work or of artists working here, working today. Uh, and community and uh, university galleries play an important role in that. Um, sometimes people don't realize, I mean, it's known by people in the arts, but the general public doesn't know that university and college galleries are very vibrant spaces. And that they're committed to, um, you know, to, sh to showcasing artists in the region. And, and so I'm very excited to be able to do that. Um, and then, and I'm also very excited to, I just got a text from my student on Saturday. She's like, I just got a full time job at the San Diego History Center, uh, helping with the education department. You see, I've, you know, this was my dream to work in the museum world, to work in these organizations and, Thanks to your class, I'm now able to do this. And this was, you know, she was my student. She graduated from the program one year ago, and she'd been working part time in different museums. And now she has her full time position in the in the museum. And so that's so exciting to me, and it makes me so happy to see those students succeeding. And if I go every museum and arts organization that I go to in San Diego, I have one or two students working there. Amazing. What a journey. This is this is absolutely amazing. And you know what? I love the way you're talking about your career in academia with uh, such passion and uh, enthusiasm and inspiration, like the artists would just talk about their studio work. You know, I have I have lots of artists on my on my show. And that's kind of like the conversation that we have, you know, the experiences uh, they are bringing into their work, the, how it all getting expressed on the canvas or whatever medium they're uh, they're working with. And in my mind, uh, when we started this conversation, I was like, okay, well, that's going to be a lot of, you know, uh, not necessarily dry, but very academic conversation about how things work and, you know, the museum studies and art history and uh, teaching and all, that kind of stuff. But I, I hear you talk with the same level of passion and inspiration, uh, like I would expect from from any other artist in the, in, in this show, and uh, and that 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 makes me excited as well. And, and it's it's uh, it's really uh, it's really inspiring and empowering Thank to know you. that we have we have such programs and uh, people like you driving the change and driving the uh, like evolution of the art community in San Diego County. This is this is amazing. Well, thank you for doing this. First of all, for 22 years, this is amazing. Let me tell you about the new friends and sponsors of the show, Perspective Space. Perspective Space is a unique venue in the heart of Encinitas, California open for individuals and companies that promote mindfulness, creativity, sustainability, and connection through their practice. 
The space is open and bright and well suited for art shows, yoga, photo shoots, sound healing, art classes, workshops, and other community gatherings of up to 60 people at a time. Perspective Space is a project by Think Parallax, a local sustainability strategy and communications agency that generously opened up its office for the local art community during the pandemic. I interviewed the CEO, Jonathan Hanwood, in Season 8, Episode 6, and I am dedicating several episodes in this season to feature their artists and residents. To learn more, go to PerspectiveSpace.com or click the banner on InTheArtScene.com. It's P-E-R-S-P-E-C-T-I-V-E-S-S-P-A-C-E dot com or click the banner on InTheArtScene.com. I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned that uh, being in San Diego while finishing your PhD would really um, help you with the project that you had in mind for your PhD program, uh, for, for your P- PhD uh, 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 research, uh, mm-hmm. which is the border art. And mm-hmm. uh, you are uh, very much involved in in this uh, you know, dual art uh, space and which is San Diego because we have a lot of Latino artists. We have a lot of people from from Tijuana uh, and Rosarito and uh, you know some like northern Baja coming uh, to San Diego and a lot of San Diego artists are uh, you know traveling across the border uh, back and forth. So I wanted to hear like have you done this study? What what came into it and what's the border art uh, in like in your research and your vision and your uh, exploration? Well, I think what is really exciting about this region is that you have, uh, you have uh, the art that emerges in, in, in both Tijuana and San Diego area um, that is communicating about very important issues that are going on, in, not only in our nation, but globally. Um, which is the, 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 the concept of migration and, and how there's, in a sense, this big obstacle, you know, there's this fence that is getting, uh, larger and larger and much more impenetrable. Um, but on the other hand, there's also a fluidity because there are so many people that are able to navigate and go across the border. I have many students in my college that actually come from Tijuana every day to study here. And uh, right now they're they're looking at um, supporting more of our our community college students who are binational and, and are both U.S. citizens and Mexican citizens, and they have that ability to come across. And so there's this interesting thing of like, the barrier, but also the fluidity of the border. And there's artists who historically have not only uh, created art about these issues, but are very much activists in bringing attention to what's happening in the border. So I became really fascinated about how art can make us dream about better solutions um, there's one of my favorite pieces that I had at the Oceanside Museum of Art was, um, was artist Ana Teresa Fernandez, who grew up here. She's now a professor in San Francisco, but she, um, she did a beautiful project where she painted away the border fence. She set up, um, uh, a, a, a ladder on the Mexican side of the border and she had some paint and she painted the metal fence in the same colors as the ocean. And it's where the um, fence actually meets the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And you have the sky and the ocean. And so she painted the fence in the color of the sky and the ocean. And she was wearing a tight black dress and high heels because it was also kind of a commentary like, 
as a feminist, you know, they say women can't do this or can't do that. Well, I'm going to do it as a woman, but with a tight dress and high heels. <laughs> and she climbed on this ladder and she's painting away the border. And then she took this and then she took this picture from afar and it looked like the fence. So this artist has made wow. the fence disappear. Wow. Like a magical act. It's, it's kind of a process of magical thinking and magical creating. And, and, and it's surreal. But at the same time, it makes us see a different kind of possible reality, right? That to take away that that fence. And so I was really, really fascinated by all these artists because I I just feel that if we had artists that are have these creative solutions, uh, we could solve a lot of the problems that we we have. Um, so uh, so I love that conversation and that engagement. And the other thing is that. It's very interesting to me that in a city that's a border city like Tijuana, and you know there is such a stark con- contrast when you cross from San Diego to Tijuana. San Diego right now being the most expensive city in the United States, you mm-hmm. know, it was just mm-hmm. called that, you know. And you cross into Tijuana and you see how it's a city that struggles, right? Struggles because there's not the 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 wealth you know that we have here the infrastructure is is failing you know there's a lot of problems and yet it's a city that promotes culture and creativity and so this is really interesting to me both the contrast of like the wealthiest city in the northern hemisphere abiding this border town you know border city that is um also contributing to this cultural landscape. Uh, and you'll have Tijuana artists who are my friends who are showing in Europe, you know, showing in Berlin, you know, showing in, 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 in Amsterdam, or there's artists going to China, you know, there's a, a, a Meli Barragan and Daniel Ram, Ranova for a while had this um, TJ in China project where they were working with artists, I believe it was in Shanghai, you mm-hmm. know, and you have Shinpei Takeda, who's an artist from Japan, who moved not, not to San Diego, but to Tijuana because he connected to the vibrancy of the arts. Because artists in Tijuana have to kind of make do with what is available to them. And that makes them extremely resor- resourceful and resilient. But but it also shows that there's an amazing arts education happening in Tijuana, that the colleges and the universities there are training artists in conceptual art because there's been a history of the arts in that region, you know, starting in the, I think it really emerges and becomes important in the 1960s. So I'm fascinated by all of those variables, right? And all of those things. And I'm I'm looking from the perspective of an academic, also that kind of larger cultural landscape and those relationships and and uh, what uh, what makes culture, right? Uh, and it's not always wealth that makes culture. We think that it's privilege and wealth that makes culture, but not necessarily, you know? It's inventiveness. It's the ability to think critically and analyze. It's the freedom to create. Um, it's not being afraid, you know, if you only have, you know, access to these materials, you know, we use with this recycled materials. Um, the other thing that also comes into play with the study of the border is also the fact that this used to be Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. This becomes part of the United States with the Mexican-American War of 1848. And then um, that legacy of this being Mexico is still part of also who we are as a city, right? All of the names of in San Diego are in Spanish, right? And um, you also have the Kumeyaay and the indigenous, which is mm-hmm. also very connected and tied in. And, and then the other thing, I teach Chicano art and Chicano art is also so important. And Chicano Park, I think it's one of the examples of socially engaged art in the nation that should be studied because it's not only a a beautiful set of murals that talk about identity of the community, but it was the springboard to that whole community and neighborhood becoming politicized and understanding how they could play a bigger role in decisions that were being made for them 
And from that activity of making the park, they realized we have agency and we can get involved. And from that, you now see Barrio Logan Mm -hmm. is one Mm -hmm. of the only areas here in San Diego that has been designated as a cultural um, region, you know, mm-hmm. a, a cultural yeah, neighborhood. Our district. Our, our, the cultural district yeah, yeah. with Balboa Park. Yeah. So think of it, Barrio Logan, Balboa Park here in the city of San Diego, Oceanside too. But it's just, so, so for me as an academic, you know, looking at all of these things is really fascinating. And I'm very hopeful. You know, right now it's a very difficult time in the world but when I teach my class and I show up the students and I take them, to, I'm going to take them tomorrow to Chicano Park. We're going to walk around to see these murals. Or when we go and see an artist and we sometimes we'll go tell them, you know, bring a Tijuana artist to showcase what they're doing. And I see how they, um, against all odds, they create. That gives me hope. So, so what I teach every day on border art, on issues of migration, on Chicano Park and resilience and affirmation of, you know, who we are and our culture and, and also establishing those communi- communication and those connections, right, uh, is really important. So, so that is also why I think I love my job, because it kind of counters the difficulties that we see outside of, you know, our environment. And, and there's difficulties, obviously, here, too. Um, but I see a lot of my artist friends, um, you know, helping now with refugees that are coming into the into our uh, the city of San Diego. A lot of my artist friends are part of that movement to to help out. Um, I was just thinking of the pandemic. A lot of the artists that started making the masks, you know, mm-hmm. and and to me, um, art offers a solution. You know, and and art also creates empathy, and creates compassion, and creates connection. If we didn't have literature, if we didn't have theater, if we didn't have the visual arts, if we didn't have dance, you know, it makes us realize of the beauty of, of kind of the human spirit. Uh, and that, that is just, just very, very lovely and very beautiful. And, and, and that's why I love what I do. I'd like, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I, I'm so, so fortunate and so lucky. And so, um, and that's what I try to relate to my students and, I have students who take my class who already have masters. I have students who are directors of organizations who take my class because I think they come to just have these conversations. So well, I expand I expanded into other things, but you know, <laughs> from the border, but you know. It's amazing that you're creating this platform for people to actually talk about the influence of art in the uh, in our region and actually globally on a global scale and uh uh, yeah, that that's that's amazing to to uh, hear you talk about all those different issues, and it kind of got me thinking about a few different things. Like, first of all, uh, your point about uh, Tijuana artists being so resourceful and creating despite the difficulties, uh, kind of got me thinking that when we are in our comfort zone and the comfort bubble, our art becomes stagnant, right? And it it. Uh, and the moment we are actually out of our comfort zone because of that, uh, you know, the sense of, you know, something has to change. We have to we have to do something uh, when when we're out of the, our comfort zone. This is when the revolutionary um, uh, innovative things are, are coming out because because of the necessity of, you know, bringing order into chaos right Mm -hmm. and uh, another thing when you were talking about uh you know the the um, uh, the pandemic and the immigrants and and everything and i was i was going to ask you uh um that must have influenced the way you're teaching your class and and your border studies you know the recent uh events with uh, a lot of Ukrainian uh, uh, refugees coming through the Tijuana border to San Diego uh, uh, and Russians who are fleeing from that situation as well. And now we're having this conflict in Israel and Gaza, which I'm I'm pretty sure is going to, um, you know, manifest itself in in our uh, border city. Uh, So, yeah, I think 
uh, so did that did that uh, bring some new uh, information into your studies? Well, I think that's something that's um, I'm looking at because it's going to change definitely. <clears throat> Not only the, the 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 demographic and people that we have here, but it's also going to influence the cultural you know production, right? Because people are going to bring also their ideas uh, into it, and I think I think the the more diverse a society, the richer it is, right? And I think that's why large cities, you know, Los Angeles, New York, you know, and and by extension, obviously now San Diego. Uh, that Chicago, that's where you have this kind of vibrant, you know, arts um, and culture, because you also have all of these different people with different experiences communicating with each other. Right. And so um, you have also a lot of people from Haiti, you know, in, in Tijuana. Now you'd see a lot of Haitians that have mm -hmm. come and, and have settled there because some of them can't come into the United States. So, so that is also kind of changing the land, and um, and for me, it's it's um, it's just going to make our experiences richer. Uh, and I think that I'm more of an internationalist, right? Like I, I think that that coming together, people from different parts of the world coming to, together to try to find solution, uh, rather than this you know, separation, isolation, uh, is what's going to make change. Um, so, so, so I'm interested and in our college, definitely we have a lot of the, 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 uh, the, the people who arrive, we are, we are a, we are the place for them to come and learn English and get their studies, uh, community colleges and our continuing education program is the most kind of democratic system. And um, and through the years, I've had many students from different parts of the world. One of my my students is from Ukraine, um, and um, and I have another student from Iran. And and in conversations, even within that environment of the classroom, they have taught us about their experiences, and we have learned, uh, you know, from each other. So um, so I think that what we really what we have to be careful is because there's also a lot of people who do not want to welcome, you know, people from other places. I want to create this 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 kind of barriers and um and so um allaying like those worries or those fears from from those people is important too. Understanding how many people can come and contribute to our economy. Right on 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 so many of our industries, um, so that's important too. Uh, it's it's a much larger problem. But I was just thinking that one of the murals that Judy Baca painted for the World Wall, mm -hmm. she actually painted with an artist from Gaza and an artist from Israel, oh, and they amazing. painted this mural together oh, about amazing. peace, and um, and I think that is kind of. You know, I think as artists, you're you're uh, you have this ability to to dream, and and I think that's probably what we need, right? To dream a solution. And um, and then the other thing I, I tell my students, and this is also in 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 a kind of a larger context, because we we talk about. Uh, you know, being kind of self serving, and and I I I hate this term networking, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I've replaced it by community building. That's what we need to do. It's not networking for my own advantage. It's not connecting to you to see what I can get out of you. It's building a, something with you, reaching out so that we together can collaborate. And what can we do together to make things, you know, better, to make things different? I love that. I love that. Goodness. I had so many questions that I was going to ask you. Uh, we, we have already spoken for 50 minutes. <laughs> and, and, and I believe we can go for another hour. Uh, but I would rather bring you back uh, sometime on the show because I would really love to talk about uh, the the process of curation and what goes into it, the museum studies and other things. But in the remainder of the time that we have today, I actually wanted to ask you about your work. 
because okay. uh what I see on your Instagram, you are surrounded by someone else's work. I, <laughs> I wasn't able to find, and I know that you are, you're dedicated, you're still working, you're an amazing uh -huh. artist. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your work and uh, wanted you to tell people where they can see it um, and if they can see it. So there are a few pieces. If you look down my Instagram, I just did like that big three by four um, woodcut that we did with a steamroller. Mm -hmm. So my work is kind of hidden in there. There's like a few places. If you go down, you can find some of my works. But I don't feel really the necessity to showcase my work so much because my work is very personal. I make work usually when I need to process something. Ironically, I work, I make some wor work a lot of times when I'm going through a painful situation. And generally when I'm happy, I don't want to make work because I'd rather go dancing or, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, or hang out or just relax. So I, um, I make work. I, I, I was trained as a painter and printmaker. It was actually a lot of fun to make that gigantic, you know, three by four um, woodcut. Mm -hmm. And I carved it and, and in, in, in this um, large piece of, of birch wood uh, that was um, about kind of love and relationships and kind of, you know, a new stage. But to me, it's really good that my work is not central to who I am because Right now, my work is teaching and my work is connecting people. And I serve on the Arts Commission and I serve on some museum board boards and small nonprofits. And to me, that is very satisfying. My work is being a connector of things and figuring things out. And, and it's as important to me as making as the things that I make that are very personal so, so yeah, so people can go to, I don't have a website, so people can kind of go to my Instagram and look through things and the pictures <laughs> I have of all the other people. Make their the own discoveries. <laughs> and make the discoveries down, you know, if you're looking through it. Um, I still love the process of making art because I love that meditative space when you're really making work and you are, the time kind of stands still, you know, because you are so engrossed in creating something. Um, and I write poetry also. So that's other something else that I do that is expressive. But it's, you know, right now in my life, my art is, is not, it's not important for my art, art to be out there. And I also don't really care for my art as an object. Um, I did drop something off for the bread on salt um, mm -hmm. call, mm -hmm. but my art as an object itself is not really, it's not really important. I much lo more love, I have a great respect for artists who make that investment of time and effort into creating. I have a lot of respect for that. I, I'm not like that. I, you know, a lot of artists tell me I have to make or I can't live. For me, no, I could probably just go lay down in a beach and you know, and enjoy, and I would, I never touch a, you know, never make art and I would be fine. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it, it plays a very different role in my life. I may, I have art, I make art when I need to process something. And the other times I'm just enjoying myself doing everything else. Um, and my art, a lot of my art does deal with more of my issues as a woman uh, as a feminist, more than dealing with issues of, I mean, I did work in my twenties that dealt a little bit with being a Latina or an immigrant or things like that. But what is at the core things that I'm processed always emotionally is, you know, being a woman and, um, being a mother and being, um, constrained sometimes by a lot of institutions of, marriage and you know patriarchy and and a lot of um those things are kind of fascinating to me you know specifically now with the challenges to you know Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. and the things that are happening and I feel that I love to touch upon issues that as a woman because it connects me to so many women all across different backgrounds generations and um, and that the idea of that sisterhood is, is really, you know, important to me. 
That's amazing. And thank you so much for your perspective. And it's it's really uh, kind of a comforting to hear that it is okay to not want to make art sometimes when you're enjoying life, you know, in other ways. And, and uh, um, the way you're talking about the sisterhood and motherhood and, and uh, those processes really speaks to me because of, you know, the the time in my life that, you know, I'm going through uh, right now, kind of reinventing myself uh, in my career ways and being a mom to a young child. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really, oh my God, I had, uh, I feel like I just blinked and an hour went by. I, I could have listened to you for another few hours straight, no problem. But I think, um, I think, uh, you need to go about your day. And, uh, I know that you are very busy and thank you so much for coming on the show. I would love to have you back at some point if, if your time permits. And, uh, we'll see you again in the art scene. Uh, we'll go to Brad and Sold and, and take on your original. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kalina. This was really lovely to to chat. And, you know, yes, I teach a class that's six hours long, so I can talk for a long time. <laughs> but I will it make was sure, really lovely. Yeah, I will make sure to put the link to your class in the show notes and to your Instagram. Uh, and uh, I, I found some, some media outlets uh, that, you know, have done interviews with you. Uh, so people can actually go and learn about a little bit more about what you do and what kind of person you are and maybe sign up for your class uh so you guys go to in the find the show notes for this episode and uh check all the resources on all the references that we're talking about i would also uh include uh judy baka um link to spark and to her work uh so you guys can have that reference too so again alessandra thank you so so much <laughs> Well, I'm thank so you. Thank you, Galina, because you're also doing these interviews are really a wonderful resource. And I'm so honored that you invited me and I've enjoyed listening to the others. So I hope that people will check, check and thank you for listening listen to, to it <laughs> because that's really wonderful. Amplifying and, you know, and, and bringing attention to all of the wonderful artists that we have in a in our region. That's really great. I am doing you know my part to build the community as well. <laughs> It has been another episode of In the Art Scene Podcast. If you liked today's conversation, please give us a good review on Apple and go listen to other great stories. Check out our website intheartscene.com or follow us on Instagram at intheartscene for more content. If you are a creative and you want to share your story, shoot us a message from the website or DM us on Instagram. Look forward to seeing you next time in the art scene.